Good evening, everyone, and welcome to UX and Data. Tonight, you're going to hear from John Patel. Uh, John is a serial entrepreneur who has co-founded and run more than half a dozen startups in the San Francisco Bay Area. He writes frequently about media, advertising, and technology issues, and is the author of a best-selling book on Google called The Search. In the last year, he's been called on as a leading authority to testify before the US Senate on what to do about Facebook, Google, and the other tech giants. John is CEO and co-founder of political video platform, The Recount. He also teaches on internet business models and technology policy at Columbia University School of International and Public Affairs. That's quite a bio, and I think we still only covered a, a small portion of it. So please welcome John. Hi. Okay, I'm gonna figure this out. So I've done this, um, <clears throat> this particular talk once. I'm a little nervous, even. So, um, uh, and I'm gonna try to explain how it is I'm talking about architectures of control related to data and society, and yet running a political, oh, sorry, thank you, and yet running a political media company, which doesn't seem to make a lot of sense. But hopefully, by the time I'm done, it might make a little bit of sense. Um, so I moved to New York. Um, as Kim said, I, my whole life I've lived in the valley. I actually live in, lived in Marin. If you guys know where that is, it's on the other side of the Golden Gate Bridge. To sort of be a little bit away from the valley because the valley is like weird. Um, and, but I, my, I was a reporter and then editor and then I started companies and more companies and, and I left about a year ago to move here because the, the conversation started to get, it turned very inward. It got all about itself. Um, and, and the valley is already a pretty insular place. But it started to be that if you want to have a conversation about more than just starting a company, people weren't interested in talking to you. The only thing that people wanted to talk about, I know I'm here at General Assembly and that probably most of you are really interested in companies and entrepreneurship. I am too. I'm starting my seventh company right now, I must be. But it's nice to think about other things. Um, and so uh, I, when you move to New York, it's like it, no one really cares if you're a tech entrepreneur, right? Like you're walking down the street and people are doing 150 different other things and you're in San Francisco and it is a company town, which means it's a town that only talks about making companies. It's not even a tech town, it's a company town. Um, so I moved to get away from that. Uh, to go to Columbia and start thinking about ideas that were related to tech, um, but also related to policy and related to other things. And I wanted to bump into other human beings who might want to think about these things without asking how you might turn that into a stock symbol. Um, so I'm here now. It's been about a year. I still feel like a tourist. Everyone who lives here says I have to live here another nine years before I can say I'm a New Yorker. So I got a lot of time to go. So I've, I want to start with a little context. I'm doing kind of two things right now. Um, Kim mentioned the Columbia thing, and the other thing is this uh, company, Recount Media. So I almost raised my hand. We're hiring. I've got a design lead role for the entire company, which encompasses our apps, our site, our UX, our design you know, uh, uh, framework and vocabulary, everything. And I've got UX design positions. I've got a lot of stuff going on, so see me after. Um, okay. So... The other thing, you know, besides uh, doing that company, I am studying uh, the flows of data in society, and in particular, I am studying uh, terms of service for the top four uh, tech companies, and it is super frustrating. Um, I call this, it's broke, let's fix it, um, because I think that our approach to how data flows in society is broken, so I'm going to get into that. So let's talk about data. I imagine all of you have been thinking about data, right? I mean, how many of you like data, 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 eh, data? Um, it has become an obsession. It's sort of, you know, the, everyone's like, data is the new oil, data is this, data is that, data is that. But, you know, I'm curious how much you've thought about this word, governance, right? How much have we thought about that word? Well, actually, thanks to Trump, if you just change it to government, it's like, endless anxiety, at least for me, and like the notifications on my phone are like, Trump just did this insane thing, and it's like, our government is broken, it's good, it's, you know. But governance, governance is something else. And then I bet you really haven't thought about this phrase, 
data governance. Um, I kind of want to get into that. So let's define some terms. Um, what is governance? It's an architecture of control. Governance are rules that basically tell us how we move through society, right? Um, I'm particularly interested in governance as it relates to corporations. And in that context, using um, various uh, dictionary definitions, the best is a system of rules, practices, and processes by which a firm is directed and controlled, governed. I'm on a few boards of directors. Um, I am a governor of a company. We set the rules um, of how that company works. But when I'm talking about governance, I'm talking about the system of rules and practices by which a firm controls its relationship to communities, to its relationship with societies. Um, is that me? No? Okay. Cool. You know, so to developers, to users and customers, um, people in the ecosystem. So let's define data. I love this. My definition of data is unrefined information. Um, I'm not in love with this phrase, but it's, again, the second time I've given the talk. If you have a better one, please tell me. But data is the core commodity from that, that we then create information from. Data in and of itself, as probably many of you know, is pretty useless um, until we make sense of it, right? And sense making is what we all do really well. Humans are good at sense making. We are processing organisms. Um, I think it's inarguable that the difference between data and information is human meaning. Socrates reference for all you philosophy buffs out there. Um, so information is data organized in a way that it means something to us, right? Um, it also might be uh, the next official law of thermodynamics if you study this stuff. It's pretty cool that there's a debate going on right now with physicists that information, in fact, might be related to an undiscovered law of thermodynamics, but that's geeky and we'll move on. Um, there, as we've learned sort of kind of the hard way in the last decade, there are a few really large companies that um, have a massive catalog of meaningful human information. Um, if any of you have seen the, you know, incredibly thick book uh, called Surveillance Capitalism by Shoshana Zuboff, she's kind of done a masterful job of, 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 of laying out a strong hypothesis that these companies actually are aware that they are cornering the market on human meaning. Um, and so I've been obsessed with this for over two decades, and it seems like it's finally becoming part of the social conscience, which is kind of... Uh, awesome that I can actually talk about this and people's heads nod. Um, so I think we're in the middle because everyone's talking about data, 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 and not many people are talking about Socrates and human meaning and the laws of thermodynamics, but people are starting to talk about data, right? And we're sort of in this great enlightenment. This is John Locke. Um, it's sort of data enlightenment. We're realizing that this resource is, is changing human knowledge, very similar to what we went through during the enlightenment period. Um, so I want to let a, sort of lay a little context and go back to the Enlightenment and, and recall many scholars believe that the greatest document to come out of the Enlightenment is this one, the United States Constitution. It was sort of the, the, the capstone of centuries of thinking and philosophy about what the role of how we govern ourselves and what the role of the individual is in relationship to society, which was really uh, one of the core themes of the Enlightenment. Right? Our political and economic culture today is a direct descendant of this document. Obviously, it's a living document. Democracy in the United States is founded on Enlightenment principles. The cornerstone of the Enlightenment idea, there's our pal Aristotle, is the scientific method. Right? I mean, we all have heard of the scientific method, and most of us could probably sort of, at least before I started studying this, I could sort of fake my way through saying what it was. Um, but, you know, it's considered thesis formation, rigorous observation, comprehensive data collection on those observations, healthy skepticism about forming insights based on that data, and peer review. That's the scientific method. That's how we managed to make things that got us to the moon. Or, I don't know, 
you know, weather satellites that say the hurricane's going one way or another, for example, Alabama. Um, <clears throat> so all of that turns on the data, right? On our rigorous observation and then peer review based on insights from that observation. So that led me to think, huh, you know, who has the best data? The most of it and the best of it. Those guys do. They just have the best data. As a matter of fact, as an investor, which is one of the things I've done for 20 years, in the last 10 years, I have even found myself saying to entrepreneurs, that's a great idea. But, you know, Google has a lot more data than you're ever going to have. How are you going to get past that, right? I mean, you hear it over and over and over again. Amazon, oh, you're going to do a commerce play? Well, eh, Amazon, right? It's kind of a bummer. Um, but technology companies are driven, sort of driven by this raw economic profit-seeking capitalistic mentality want to hoard this data, right? And that's a problem. And it's one that we've only just begun to talk about. When I testified before Congress, as Kim mentioned, and I started talking about this stuff, it was like, whew, right? It was like, what are you talking about? I'm like, well, it matters who controls. Okay, I'll see you later in your office. Um, so, but there's an important question, right? If data is so important, if it defines human meaning, if it becomes a way to create an architecture of control, who's governing it? I mean, who's governing the data? In the United States, the truth is, we don't have an answer to that question. We literally do not have an answer to that question. Now, for personal, personal identifiable information, like health information, we have HIPAA, right? And we have some child protection laws about data related to kids. But for the mass of the information flowing through the internet, we have no governance system as it relates to the US government. None. But there is one. I call it the default internet constitution. We have a document, or rather about 96,000 pages of documents, that govern how data flows through the internet. And we have all agreed to it. They're called terms of service and end user license agreements and privacy policies. Amazon has 15 different documents that are all related and connected and linked to their terms of service. Um, if you're a developer, there are even more. So this is the governance model for the US internet today. I mean, we actively ignore them. Uh, research uh, that was done a few years ago said that if we actually, with a high school level reading, actually no, it was college level reading, read every single thing that we agree to every year, it would take 76 working days. I mean, that's insane. But that's our governance system for, for data right now. And the, the thing that I find most interesting is when you study these documents, you realize that they hem this data into a silo, into a very prescribed relationship between the end user and the platform. Who wrote these? Lawyers. Who'd they listen to? Capitalists. And let's be clear, I'm not blaming those of you who fall in this category, engineers. What do lawyers and capitalists care about? Protecting their core business model. That's their job, their true north, their one mission, make money for shareholders. What do engineers care about? Give me as much data as I possibly can have so I can make the best product, which is a pretty cool thing. And I guess you could say making a lot of money for shareholders is a pretty cool thing too, if you're a shareholder. But in the Valley, I truly believe that in the beginning of this process that we are now at the apex of, where we started having these sort of click wrap end user agreements, engineers really did want all the data they could possibly get for no nefarious purpose. They wanted it so they could make cooler shit. They really did. A lot of them were my friends. But something happened along the way. The business model that drives most of this data collection, as we well know, is advertising, engagement, right? 
What ensures that engagement? Information, human meaning, refined from your data. That's what does it. So processing that is now intellectual property of those firms. How does Instagram choose the next thing to show you? Do you have any idea? Neither do they, but it works. They're just like the guy behind the curtain at Wizard of Oz just spinning dials and pulling levers. They're like, oh, that worked. I mean, it is so complex that the people who run those platforms have told me, I don't know. I just keep futzing with it and testing and iterating and then this works. That's governing us. That's a little, little bit scary to me. So I decided to try to draw a map, my first map, and it became the work at Columbia. So this is literally the whiteboard that I did that got me the grant at Columbia of the architecture of control for terms of services. <laughs> That's it. Um, and you see, like, the data owner and controller is up here, the platform, the cloud, whatever the hell you want to call it, right? And down here is us. And the data goes up and the service comes down, right? What does this look like? Any of you guys remember, I mean, I do, but I'm old, like what the architecture of computing look like before the internet? Mainframe. Mainframes were exactly this. This was called a dumb terminal. And this was the mainframe, it was super expensive, and you logged into the mainframe on a dumb terminal, and it controlled everything. All the software was up there, all the control was up there, all the value exchange was up there, and you just input shit. And you said, please tell me, you know, this complex mathematical equation I need to be solved. And they would go, I'm solving it. And then it would spit you back the answer, right? So this is literally the architecture, the one that we broke away with in the big internet revolution, so, which I was a, like, I was a co-founder of Wired Magazine. I was so stoned on this shit. Like, I thought the whole world was, we were finally breaking away from this. Remember the Apple ad with the woman who throws the hammer through the, you know, that, that monolithic IBM-like thing in that Apple ad was the mainframe architecture, that the creative person was going to take the Mac and go change the world. I bought all of that hard. I built four companies based on that idea. So... <laughs> The platforms, we used to have a different architecture. I call it Internet 1.0. Some of you may have heard of a thing I started called Web 2.0 with my friend Tim O'Reilly, where we were like, the next version of the Internet is going to be so much more awesome because it has Ajax. Do you guys remember Ajax? Some people are laughing. But that's when we finally got interactivity on the Internet and things started to work and we could build, like, commerce and interactivity into what was a flat web. But this architecture where the intelligence was not in one big computer in the sky, but it was pushed to the node. That was the idea of the internet. The intelligence and the data lived at the node. And the nodes talked to each other and shared intelligence and data. There was no central place where it was all collected and controlled and the value exchange set. No, it was, it was like, complete hell on earth, to be honest, because it was a mess. But at the same time, it was a glorious mess because it was open and anyone could kind of do anything. And there were so many intelligent, well-meaning humans who got together and created these crazy organizations to try to govern it, most of which are still around, but not as nearly as important or powerful as they once were. So the platforms, I believed, this was going to turn into Internet 2 and 3 and 4, and it was just going to, this architecture was going to stick. This obviously was a better architecture than the mainframe architecture, and I really thought it would just keep evolving. And then about 2011, 2012, I had a company, a big company, that was a social media company that focused on blogging. Remember that? Um, and we had thousands, tens of thousands of sites all on the platform happily sharing data and, and advertising and hoo-ha. Revenues were going like this and then it went like this. Like, what happened? Facebook started putting advertising in the newsfeed. That's what happened. 
And all of a sudden, all the advertising that was supporting tens of thousands of sites went to Facebook because it was easier, it was more efficient, it was more convenient. And if you're a media buyer, who doesn't like that? I mean, you have to buy like something on 5,000 sites or you can buy Facebook. And by the way, it worked better, I'll admit it, at least for the KPIs that they have, you know, and it was a little bit less expensive. That's when I started noticing that the architecture of control was changing. So to me, I think we need to change the architecture of control again. And I think the only way to do that is politics, which is how I get to what I'm doing now. I don't think we can do it by imposing some new technical wizardry. I don't think we can engineer our way out of this. This is not a question of technology anymore. It is a question of what we as a society collectively wish. What do we wish for as the place we want to live? We have to go to a new architecture. Of course, I have like a mountain road because I like mountains. So I couldn't figure out the right thing to show here, but I like mountains, so that seemed good. Um, I want a new architecture that pushes control and power and governance back to the individual. So I've given this some thought, and I know what I want. And it sort of comes down to this phrase. Let the data flow. Let it go sideways. Let it go in different dimensions, in time and space. Let it go where it might want to go or where others might want to take it. Get out of that mainframing architecture. Get out of those terms of service. So I developed a couple of sort of scenarios to help you think through this. First one, you come home one day and there's a package from Walmart. How many of you guys shop? I mean, we're in New York, so I'm going to ask this and assume no hands go up. How many of you shop at Walmart? Okay, none. Maybe you're just embarrassed. I don't know. But there's a package from Walmart. And you open it up, and there's a beautifully wrapped gift box. And it's an invitation to join the Walmart VIP club or some such thing. And what they want you to do, what they invite you to do, is you give them your entire history of your purchases and interactions on Amazon, all that data. You give it to them. They're going to munge it, process it. And in a second later, they're going to tell you, wow, you spent $1,700 on Amazon last year. If you had spent it on walmart.com, you would have saved $500. So here's a $500 credit to start shopping on at Walmart right now. And you're like, wow, 500 bucks? Damn, I might actually try Walmart. I might actually try that, right? Can that happen right now? No, because I've read Amazon's terms of service. Here's another one. You want to start a restaurant in your neighborhood, wherever you happen to live. You guys look like you all live in Brooklyn. <laughs> so you're like, there's just not a good Indian restaurant in Brooklyn. I want to start an Indian restaurant. I love Indian restaurants, and like, I hate the fact there isn't one. How did it used to be if you were that entrepreneur? The way it used to be was you would literally put your finger in the wind, and if you could get enough friends and families to give you like 65,000 bucks, you buy some equipment, get a lease, and hope things worked out. That's pretty much every restaurant opening story I've ever heard, right? And usually it doesn't. That's also pretty much every restaurant opening story I've ever heard. But imagine if you could do this. Imagine if you could go up to a site. It was like a data request for proposal site. And you put up your request for proposal. OK, everybody, I'm going to give you 50 bucks if you give me all your Uber data, your Lyft data, your Yelp data, your Resi data, your OpenTable data, your Google searching data. Just give me access to it all. Anonymize it. It's all being audited by DocuSign's data auditing department or whatever, some trusted third party that's involved in this platform. 50 bucks for the first 500 people who give me that data. And then you take that data and you give it to another service who, for like a couple thousand bucks, tells you all of the demand patterns that that data tells you about your neighborhood. You can geofence that data within walking distance or an easy cab ride of where you want to start that restaurant. And now you can see whether there truly is any demand for this kind of a restaurant. You could get all of this done maybe for fifteen or $20,000, and it shows, well, actually, a Greek restaurant would be pretty good here. 
And you're like, well, you know what? I like Greek. I can do Greek. I'll start a Greek restaurant. And then you go to the bank and you say, I need a loan for, now let's call it $85,000 because you just spent 20 on this. But you know this has a high probability of happening and the bank knows this has a high probability. They see your data. You've got the insights from that data. Now you're not just putting your finger in the wind. Now you've got a plan. Now you've got information. You've got power. Can you do that now? Hell no. Uber's not going to give you that data. Resi's not going to give you that data. Google's not going to give you that data. Why? That's crazy to me. This is like low-hanging fruit just spoiling on the ground. And no one's using it. Why did we build an economy where this isn't possible? It drives me nuts. I think we should let the data flow. How do we make this real? How can we make this happen? That's the sort of obsession of my work. 2019, I predicted, I write, um, if you go to my blog, it still exists. Um, <laughs> it's kind of empty right now because I'm starting this company, I don't have time to write, but every year I write predictions, and I have since 2002 or three. And my prediction was 2019 was gonna be the year of government regulation on the technology industry, but that nothing was going to happen. But everyone was gonna talk about it all year long which is almost exactly what has happened so far. Everybody's talking about regulation and every tech CEO is getting dragged up and put in front of Congress and has to like say, well, I'm sorry, but you know, it's complicated. We're aware of the problem and our best people are on it. Um, that's Facebook's like slogan at this point. And I'm like, no, 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 maybe we need to rethink things. Maybe we don't need to break them all up with antitrust. Maybe we don't need to do some honest ads act, which is the, kind of the only legislation that might actually pass this year, um, where we try to regulate the advertiser, right? Because that's where the problem is, isn't the Russians bought all these ads, so we better get some regulation on the advertising industry. Now look, I've sold hundreds of millions of dollars worth of advertising in my career, so I'm a bit biased, but I don't think that's the right thing to do. I have an idea. I want to bounce it off you. I call it the Token Act. It's a really bad, bad name. I've got to get better at this. This is not crypto tokens. Although it, it probably could be, you know, based on, uh, you know, a distributed ledger and all that kind of good technology. Blockchain. There I said it, but it's been like half an hour. Um, um, but a token in that, what if... You could make a token of your data, like that Walmart data that I suggested in the first example, or your Uber data, or your Resi data, OpenTable data, whatever it is. You could go to that site, and because of an act of law passed by Congress, you could request your token with a little tokenator interface that probably everyone used the same one, saying, I want this data but not that data, whatever it is you're asking for. You could take that token, you literally physically wouldn't, but you could make that token a thing that you could send somewhere. Because it is your fucking data. Read all the terms of service. They all say it. It's your data. You own your own data. Bullshit. You don't own anything if you can't do anything with it. That's not ownership. That's words. But what if you could? Turn it into a token, send it over to Walmart, and let them compete for your business. Why don't we make that possible? Why don't we make it possible for the end node of the system, the user, the customer, us, the citizen, to take that data and do something useful with it? And I presented this idea of the Token Act to Congress, and they were like, that sounds really interesting. You know, squirrel. Um, so the Token Act may be crazy and probably will never happen, but it's just one idea of probably many to sort of push us to think a bit outside of the box about how we think about architectures of control when it comes to this information. So I realized after that uh, little stint in, in front of the Senate that maybe I was, as I often do in my work, um, living a little too far in the future and maybe we need to start with where we are right now. And where we are right now is in an architecture of control that's, that's completely dominated by terms of service and, and user licensing agreements. We need to understand the map of where we are right now. So that's the work that I'm doing at Columbia. It's called Mapping Data Flows. 
And the stuff in the background is um, the first version of it that we've built. Um, data sources, types of data collected, uses for that data, and all these lines are various um, uh, different connections between that that you can explore in the visualization. Um, and if you want, I've got it up live and I can show you more of it if you're interested. But I, I spoke a little bit about, this is the last slide, I swear. Um, but wait, there's more. Uh, I spoke about advertising before, and I just wanted to say another quick thing about it. I, I've written a lot about marketing and advertising and media. It's been my whole career. I'm still chairman of a programmatic advertising company that does 1.5 billion advertising calls a day, which is about 1% of what Google does. <laughs> but hey, we're trying to make it work. Um, and it's really been interesting to watch the data flows around that and to advocate on the board and to advocate on other boards I'm on that are data related for an open approach to this so that everyone can learn from it. But I don't see advertising as a cause of, 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 of this architectural problem that we have. I mean, let's be honest, if you're an advertiser, like that small business that's starting an Indian Greek restaurant, um, Facebook's awesome, Google's great. You use those systems to reach customers and why wouldn't you? Everyone does. They have tens of millions of advertisers. People say, oh, if Procter & Gamble pulls off of YouTube, that's going to really teach YouTube a lesson. No, they did it for a year, and YouTube's profits went up, and frankly, so did Procter & Gamble's. <laughs> Odd. But why did YouTube's go up? Because there's 10 million other small customers who are more than happy to take the inventory away from Procter & Gamble. So you can't go at this from the top. You have to go at it from the control layer and the architectural layer. You can't change things by enforcing it in one industry where there happens to be a lot of money. You have to change the fundamental architecture of control. And that means that we have to, I believe, push the power and the knowledge and the intelligence to the node back to that internet one architecture. And I think now the technology is here to allow us to do it. So with that, I'll end and hopefully take some questions. And if you want to see a little more of that viz, I'm happy to show it. So thanks very much. I hope I didn't take too much of your time. John, I think it would be great to see a little more detail of the flow if you could take a minute and just show us. Sure, sure. I, I've never demoed this to anyone. Other, I have a team of grad students at Columbia, and I didn't even tell them I'm doing this. So it's super early. We haven't dressed it up. I mean, you guys are all, right, designers or interested in design? Um, this is not designed yet. This is like a very raw visualization um, that I thought I had up in one of my windows. Here it is. So um, you can see lots of information. It's like, oh man, one thing I know is they're collecting a lot, right? Every one of these categories here um, uh, is in fact uh, a collapse of three or four different other categories. We have 90 different discrete kinds of data, but we collapsed it to 30. Um, so what you can do with this right now is you can compare companies like how does Amazon compare to Facebook as it relates to um, advertising. And then you can see uh, the differences which really should be two different colors and they're not. So look, it's a demo that broke. Um, well, <laughs> what a surprise. Um, but you can explore all sorts of queries through this relatively rudimentary interface here. Um, and, uh, and see how the data flows based on the terms of services. What we did, and um, behind empowering this, is my poor grad students read every single terms of service and privacy policy of these four companies and turned every single phrase that was meaningful into a database entry, which is powering the visualization. And one thing that I know is that we've learned, the big insight from this work so far, which has been going on for about nine months, is this stuff is a hot, holy mess that does one thing, ensures that no matter what, those companies can do whatever the fuck they want with your data. It's amazing. We are, we're going to have a filter on this that they're working on now that we decided on a couple days ago, which I call the conditional filter. The language in the terms of service uses the conditional tense. We may do this, we might do that. Um, they give examples. 
we may use your data to do this. For example, we might do that and we might do that. But that's just a couple of examples. There's a 700 other things they're doing with it that are just not stated directly. As a matter of fact, I asked one of my grad students, why don't you take a few days and find every statement in the terms of service that says concretely, we will do this and only this with your data. And she's like, there aren't any, sorry. I'm like, wow. So I'm frustrated that this isn't more obvious, an insight machine, it's just not. But what we do have is a database of all the terms and I'm sure there's a lot of other smart scholars who can do better stuff than we're doing with it. So we're just gonna open source the whole thing. I'm giving a workshop at Columbia next month on it and I'm gonna be like, here, your guys turn. <laughs> it's like, we got data and we have a viz. So you have a question? Uh, so all those um, end user license agreements, they, they explicitly say what they're collection purposes, or are you inferring it they from? They do. They do, and that's... They do. Huh, um, all right. It's something of a mess because it's not always explicit in the phrase. You have to kind of tie stuff together. But they're actually pretty clear that we use this data for that purpose. But many of the purposes, um, let me get back to a uh, full collection purpose and I'll give you a couple of examples. Um, analytics. Um, oh, see this one here? any purpose. Um, company operations. Um, learn user's behavior. And then what? One might ask. Um, you know, there are you know, location-based services, right? I mean, so they'll tell you, we collect your location so we can give you location-based services. What are those? Right? Um, uh, the, my favorite thing is we will never sell your data, but we will lease it forever. <laughs> it's like, isn't that selling? I don't know, exchange for money? Anyway. Other questions? Someone had their hand up before. Um, you said that we don't have any kind of um, governance for the data architecture in this country. Do you think that GDPR is any kind of good model for what we should have? Yeah. Um, so the Generalized Data Protection Regulations is a European framework that has uh, um, been in effect for about a year, year and a half, I guess now, um, year and some months. Um, I think uh, in terms of awareness, the fact that, you know, generally most of us have at least heard of GDPR, that's a good thing. It means that we're starting to have a conversation about it. And I'm not surprised that Europe was the place it first happened for any number of reasons. Um, I don't think they got it right. I, I, they, like, like my idea of the token act or this idea. They, what they do is they say you have the right to get your data and you have your right to give it to other people. That is utterly useless without, uh, an, an, uh, without including machine readable in that phrase. If it's not machine readable and they're giving you a CD-ROM or in some cases literally a printout, it's not actually going to change anything. No consumer... It's sort of like cryptography. You guys probably... Don't remember because you weren't born, but um, in the early 90s, when we were starting Wired, like 10% of my writers, because they were science fiction authors, um, would have a PGP signed hash key with their email. And I had to deal with figuring PGP out, pretty good privacy, in order to read their damn email. Um, and that's because they were obsessed and they were living in the future and they were sure that this stuff was going to happen. Um, but nobody wants to deal with like multi-step difficult technology, we are a society of convenience and we need to make it convenient to take that data from whatever source and use it somewhere else. In law, in, in theory, the law sort of says you can do that, but in theory it kind of does here as well. What GDPR has done is that all the very large companies in the world have not only become compliant in Europe, but they're like, oh, what the hell, we'll just become compliant in every market because it pretty much is the same, you know, we're spending the money anyway, so we may as well impose it. So it's become a de facto shadow governance system for the United States, which has not been adopted here. And is without question um, uh, what Congress thinks is at least a good starting point for any national data laws that we might have here. I am convinced that such a set of laws will not actually be passed here that look like GDPR for any number of reasons. But it is sort of governing a lot of the interactions. But what is it? It's click wrap. Have you, have you run into the, this site uses cookies. 
by continuing to use this site, you agree to our terms of service you've never read. Same problem. It doesn't change anything, and it's a massive burden on small businesses that are trying to operate and don't have the lawyers and the committees and the cybersecurity squads that can actually implement GDPR. So I'm not a fan of it. Uh, thank you for the presentation. Um, what are your thoughts on analogous industries like healthcare, for example, areas where data is actually very, obviously very personal, people have a very emotional attachment to it, right. and uh, it's absolutely essential, right? And the flow, and the flow of it seems, I'm going to see what your thoughts are, yeah. it seems my impression is that there's tensions about that, and actually I know it seems your priority is the flow of data and keeping it going, and that seems to be a counterexample of regulation and, and would challenge it or, have, or restrict on it. If I continue doing this research, the next market that we're going to do is health, without question. We almost did it first, but I'm obsessed with those four companies. Um, I have a very good friend uh, and co-conspirator who we've done some stuff together who is a doctor and kind of is my Sherpa in the healthcare world because he cares about this stuff a lot. And what he taught me when I said to him, he is in fact my doctor also, um, I said, hey, doc, I'm going to see the podiatrist and, you know, I have to fill out these fucking forms and, like, that I have done a hundred times. Why don't you have a token for my data that I can just give to the podiatrist? Trusted person? Trusted person? I trust myself. Let's, why can't I do that? Regulations. First of all, they need to make sure, the podiatrist, that since that data was minted, I haven't developed cancer of the toe, you know, or whatever. I haven't started taking a new drug that isn't actually, in, like, they have to ask. That's the, one of the main reasons. But the truth is, as he explained it to me, the way that medical uh, health records, the uh, uh, patient medical health records that, that we all think we have, right, don't we? You've heard about it, right? You have, you have a, uh, it's called a, what is it, E, uh, for, electronic medical record, EMRs, right? Um, the reason that this was not built for us, I could go back into my slides to that mainframe architecture. Do you know who that was built for? The insurers. It was built so that they could bill. It was built so they could make money. It was built at their scope and request, not for us. It is actually not possible to get your EMR and give it to someone else. That information is controlled and basically owned by the insurance companies. That's fucking crazy. That is why Google, you may remember in the early 2000s, anyone remember Marissa Mayer? Before she left and ran Yahoo, she ran something called Google Health, which was supposed to revolutionize everything because everyone at Google at that time was totally stoned on the same stuff I was. I wrote a book about Google. Like, we were all high on our own supply. We're like, oh, we're technologists and we're gonna take over this total hairball of a system and sort it out because we have lots of computers. And then it was basically, the hairball was like a ball of yarn and we were all kittens. <laughs> None of it worked. Microsoft tried it too. And they're still kind of trying it. Apple, did you notice today's uh, announcements how there was not uh, uh, st st the health kit stuff that, that everyone expected them to roll out as it relates to like sleep and stuff like that. That's because they can't sort it out. It's a mess. And I think well, the main thing is, is we don't have a push from the bottom saying, wait a minute, this is mine. Why can't I do something with it? Because most of us don't give a shit. I have a, another whiteboard in my office with a, a, an eternal like do not erase question which is, how do we make people give a shit? Because that's what it's going to take, right? Um, and that's a whole other conversation, but it's an interesting one, which is, when do we actually give a shit to control our own data? And my answer is, when it's convenient and we can maybe save some money, that's when we'll give a shit. And when it's cool. <laughs> Yeah, in relation to that point, I was wondering if framing it in the individual empowerment perspective is the most helpful, right? Because, you know, constantly I hear that with uh, capitalism, surveillance, that we just need to empower the individual, control our own data. 
But first of all, people don't really care all that much. And even if you could get your token, you're missing like the larger systems of coordination, right? I'd have to get everybody else's tokens so we could actually make like a new system. So it kind of went from like larger architectures right down to the individual scale with nothing in between. And, um, and, and you kind of like glanced over antitrust as well, which, you know, I'm also, you know, I have some questions about, but, you know, wondering how that kind of all fits together. I could have done a talk on antitrust because I think antitrust is really important. Um, um, there are a lot of people much deeper and smarter than me on all this. Tim Wu comes to mind. Um, but you're right, there is a, there is a very, very, uh, you know, unarchitected middle. I, I think the, the, the way you get to architect that middle, and I made some references to like a DocuSign auditing kind of company and a company that, is, that makes a platform where people can clear tokens, you know, saying I have this RFP and, and authenticate that in fact it's valid. We need all of that infrastructure for this to work. And you can't centrally plan this. You just can't. You can't top down it. You've got to create the potential energy in the market for it to self-organize. And, and to me, the way you create potential energy in a market to self-organize is you do enlightened legislation that allows the market to thrive. We did something <clears throat> from ninety mid-90s through now uh, in the Internet, which was essentially the same thing, but, but actually the opposite, which is we took a... Uh, hands-off approach to the internet. It was a special place. The Clinton administration was like, the internet's super special, we're not gonna regulate it, right? And then there was a couple of bits of legislation that attempted to do that. The Communication Decency Act was one. And the only thing in the Communication Decency Act that stood up was Section 230. The rest of it got thrown out. And 230 essentially said, platforms have the right to let anyone say anything on them without anything happening to them which released platforms from the responsibility of a publisher and let YouTube flourish and Snapchat flourish and all these others. But we forgot about the externalities. And the externalities to society have become evident since the election of 2016. And if you have kids, they're evident every day. Um, the shit that my kid sees on Snapchat is like appalling. Um, and so, we have to work through these things, and we have a lot of middle ground to create, but my sense is it's very hard to create that middle ground until you prepare the ground to grow what you want it to grow. You need a robust, hybrid, vigorous ecosystem. And what we have right now is a monoculture. And a monoculture suck, in my opinion. Any others? Hi. Uh, my thoughts were kind of along the same line about the Token Act and what we need to do to be able to lay the groundwork for this. And it seems like you're saying the regulatory framework needs to be there. And I'm just curious, so, I mean, what, what can individuals do or organizations who want to be part of this do in the interim? Is it is it pushing for a standardized, or, but I think standardized way to think about this, but I think you're saying that that's not possible. I think the simplest thing to do is to vote. <laughs> I mean, first of all, we have to have an administration and a Congress that is willing to entertain new ideas, and we don't have that at the moment at all. I mean, we have individual members of Congress willing to... I've had conversations with individual members who are open to these ideas, but these ideas are somewhat radical, and I guarantee you, you probably saw the news about California's bill around uh, gig economy workers today. They made uh, it law in California that you cannot call uh, a uh, contractor who basically works more than 20 hours a week for you a contractor. They have to be a full-time employee, so they pay into Social Security and help build society, because society's being hollowed out by all of this. Um, Uber gave a press conference this afternoon saying, we know how to fight that. I mean, it literally said, we're good at lawsuits, just wait. So imagine that times 100 if like, a state were to do a token act. The biggest lobbyists in Washington, Google, Facebook, Apple, Amazon. They're not going to like this. They don't like the idea, of, but my, I call this the leveling, I could, I, maybe I'll call this the level playing field act. Because once the data can flow in an ecosystem, 
you have to compete on value above the level of the data. You have to compete on actual service and a better offering. Right? If it was super easy in the first five years of Facebook to take your Facebook friend graph and give it to an entrepreneur who wanted to start a better social network, we'd have way better social networks right now. But we don't. Now, antitrust can help, I think. Right? But Scott Galloway, who's written a lot about this, is essentially like antitrust. He's a professor at NYU. Antitrust is like, great, so instead of four, we'll have 15. They're all operating the same way. They're all doing the same thing. Nothing really changes, which I agree with. We need to sort of fundamentally, um, I'm not trying to be Elizabeth Warren here, but we kind of need to upend the system a little bit more than that. So I don't mean, I'm not saying vote for Bernie or something, but I'm, <laughs> I'm, if you, I would say probably Elizabeth because she thinks about this stuff a little more. But um, vote, that's what I would say. Um, and work to get us a new administration. Because this is a generational shift we have to go through. It ain't going to happen next year. Uh, so it seems like advertising is a big like, poison in the system. Mm -hmm. And a couple of ways that you suggested changing this is through legal changes, um, politics. But at the same time, it seems like um, you're very skeptical about that actually happening. I'm wondering, is there, is there a third way? Is, is it possible to, um, you know, coming from a sort of entrepreneurial background to create a new business, mm. a new system that maybe uses that type of token system, something that onboards a lot of people, yeah. and then uh, sort of creates trust, a, a new type of ecosystem? Yeah, there are a lot of people working on that, a lot. Right here in New York. A lot. Um, and uh, most of them are in the um, crypto blockchain space. Uh, and when you talk to them, I, I swear it takes us about five minutes before we're, we're, we're living in this shit I just talked about, right? Because it's not about the tech for these entrepreneurs. It's about the new distributed architecture system that allows for this kind of empowerment. You have a boiling the ocean problem. Um, and, you know, you have a usage problem, right? I mean, you can't buy a burger with Bitcoin. Um, and, and so, yes, however, is kind of the answer. And it, it goes back to the question on one of my whiteboards, which is how do we get people to give a shit? Like, how do you, how do you invoke a, a positive return system that can build that? If I knew that, I wouldn't be starting a political media company. I would be starting that company. Um, but I can't figure it out. Um, and the beauty is of, of, of entrepreneurship is that I'm super confident somebody will. But we have to remember something. The first versions of it are going to suck. Because if you guys were on the internet in 1993, it was super magical. But it sucked. <laughs> And it got better and better and better and better and better. And, and it's amazing to think that actually the web page kind of is the same as it was when Netscape went public. Kind of crazy to think how little and how much it's changed at the same time and how long it took us to get there. So you have to be patient. Hi. Um, so how would you delineate which data would get tokenized? And how would you philosophically deal with new types of data being tracked going forward. And it's kind of like I'm going from the central. If you have a person, like what's Yeah, the this point is a really important out? question. You have aggregate data, you have machine learning data, like how do you disentangle all of it and when you push it? control to the node, one of the things that has to be part of that control is your ability to expire. Right? So your ability to turn a token off. Right? You give that Amazon token to Walmart and Walmart comes back and says, well, um, we'd save you five bucks. You're like, well, dude, turn that shit off. You can't have it anymore. I'm not interested. Deal's off, right? That's really important, is the ability to control the data like that. People ask me often, why do you think people are going to spend all this time manicuring their data, right? Choosing, like, oh, you know, I want this and that and this and that to go to this place and this and that and this and that to go to other places. And I have two answers. One. Maybe they won't, maybe robots will. Agents, like agents will come and knock on your door all the time saying, you've got some valuable data, I swear I can help you out, right? And some will be trusted. There'll be like a Yelp for these agents, and some won't be trusted. 
Some will be hucksters and you'll get your data stolen. And that's just, sorry, it's already happening. It's just being done by massive mainframe silos like Equifax and the US government. I, I got top secret clearance for a board I'm on and I got a letter from the DOD. Like, sorry, your credit's screwed for the next five years because there was a hack and yeah, you were on this list of like 150,000 people who we were trying to get clearance for. Sorry. I'm like, dude, sorry? But so there's always going to be that risk. There was that risk in the open web. I mean, remember all the Time Magazine stories? Oh my God, the internet's killing everything. But I think we have both the technology uh, and I think we can muster the will to create a system that actually is far more protected because it's not about mass, it's about individual. You might get your data stolen, but not all the data gets stolen, right? Um, sorry, did I answer your question? <laughs> Uh, well, you answered an interesting question. <laughs> Not <enough> yours, though. <laughs> so if you have, um, um, there, there's some points where, like, you have your data. Like, I am, my name is Matt. I live in Jersey. You know, I bought a couple of widgets, et cetera. Um, but that might not be what's actually being exploited or used. It might be aggregated with other folks. Right. And, like, I, and that's being, you know, that's, there's like layers of distance away from me. It's well, this is related to me, and yeah. I turn it off. It's still in the system, even if I turn off individual data points. We have to. We have to. And, right. We, and, we have, and how do you define what those data points are, which are private? Well, I would say that this is why generally regulatory frameworks are thick, and you have to deal with all these exceptions, edge cases, and definitions, and so on. I mean, that's law. That's just law. That's why lawyers make the money they do because they have to stare at this shit all the time, and it's confusing and complicated. We have a confusing and complicated society that's based on law, so we just have to do the work. We have to be able to define categories of data and say, when you enter a relationship that's a data creating relationship with an entity, up until this point, and this is done in GDPR, up until this point, this data has your access and control. Beyond this point, they have the right to have metadata that's based on aggregation and anonymization, which you cannot access and do not have rights to. You have to define all of that, absolutely. But I would define it more liberally. Um, and my sense is the market could tip. For example, if Amazon wanted to go with the flow, they would say, I'll tell you what, we're going to give you what the law allows, but we can give you some juicier stuff that we got that you can also tokenize. But that comes with a VIG. So if you go over here and make value with it, we get 15% of that value. All of that can be cleared across a distributed ledger in real time once we figure out a few more processing issues with distributed ledgers, but it, it's being worked on. That could motivate companies to actually make money for the fact that they are in the business of taking unrefined data and turning it, unrefined information and turning it into insight. I think you would actually make more money as a platform if you thought about it that way. But that requires a real bit flip in thinking. But I really think that economy would be more innovative, wealthier and distributed and I think it would be super cool. I think there's going to be a lot, if this happens, there's going to be so much energy around building. Remember, like what was last year's startup thing? Last year's startup thing was startup idea plus AI, <laughs> right? That's what it was. Uh, come on, you all know it. This would be startup idea plus data flow, right? And there'd be so many of them, and there'd be so much value unlocked. The truth is that all of the value we're unlocking in uh, post-modern capitalist society is fiction. It's just fiction. It's just things we're inventing that we think are valuable. Money's fiction. So we can 10 or 100x this economy if we just imagine another world. And so by trying to map the world we're in, I'm hoping that we might inspire some new wonderful narratives that we can go live in. Hi. Um, yeah, thank you so much for your presentation. Sure. Um, so I'm thinking, and I may be oversimplifying things, but if I have a token with all my data on it, how can I control it or how can I be assured that it's being controlled properly or the right things, or how can I channel what gets given out? Multiple companies are going to uh, compete to give you a sort of you know, token dashboard that's yours. Uh, it might just be part of your operating system. It might be an iOS um, it, it might be, it probably will start as a separate sort of app or, that you, or platform that you log into. 
but it just allows you to manage all of these various relationships. There'll be standards. I mean, the, the thing is, our industry has built this before. We know how to do this. This is, there is no technical reason this can't happen. None. Um, it's just creating the proper incentives for it to emerge. And again, this is why I decided to learn about politics because it was really not very interesting to me when I was in California. I mean, really, the, I, I mean, it, must, it wasn't like on the walls at Wired, but like, do you know that um, uh, there's a great phrase uh, which is regulation, the internet sees regulation as damage to be routed around, right? I would say that on CNN in the 90s. Oh, well, you know, government's just damaged to be routed around. And that really is the ethos of Silicon Valley, right? Ask not for permission, but ask for forgiveness later. Um, that was like the Uber mantra. And I don't mean that like in the, I mean the company, <laughs> like Uber mantra. Um, but technology has run headlong into how the question of how do we as a society deal with this technology. And when you want to answer that question, you have to go to politics, because that's how we deal with things. We, we have governance, and we argue with each other, and have forums, and talk about it, and try to get smart, and make good decisions. That's politics. So I decided to get into politics, and man, it's a weird place. Just, I'm sorry to open two questions, but the, the note about human meaning and finding a purpose and things like that, you may notice before about how the, eight, the people in Google and Facebook are pointing, are, there's really no one behind the wheel, right, that these emergent data properties, especially the, the metadata effects, there's really no one guiding this. So what, do you have any meditations or thoughts on this? Because it seems oh. like inherently yeah, I wrote a piece on this. purpose. And if there's no one, if their only motivation seems to be well, profit, that's actually a prerogative by the corporation, not even the CEO. So really, it's almost as if like, no one is driving the bus in any sense. That's at least the interpretation I'm reading from this. What are your thoughts on that? Agree. <laughs> um, yeah, I agree. Um, as I said before, a lot of people that I talk to who are, in, and, and many of the, def, the, 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 the defectors who have sort of become, uh, I think, called the conscious of Silicon Valley, Tristan Harris and, and others who, who used to work in these companies, would say, I don't think anybody really knows. Like, no, there is not somebody running this. There is a collective intelligence running it, but no one, this is a collective intelligence beyond the abilities of one mind. However, that's not something that we as human beings understand. That makes us un un uneasy and nervous. So what did we do with the founders of these companies? We turned them into demigods. We turned them into mythical, mythological heroes. Up until Cambridge Analytica, Mark Zuckerberg must be a fucking genius. He's, he's, he's a genius. I mean, he was the poster child of, of the press, right? And Hundreds of thousands of college graduates every year would start a company because they wanted to be the next Mark. He, he's the guy they wanted to be, right? And I think that myth is collapsing. And what's terrifying to us is we don't know what to replace it with. And we don't like, as a society, to not have a collective story we believe in. So we start to find other collective stories. Unfortunately, I think a large group of us have found one that is really terrifying, which is populism. But the truth is that we have to imagine other collective stories. We just have to. Um, and I, and, and that I, look, I, there's no way I'm going to figure it out, but I'm going to try to add a little bit to that, right? I'm going to try to give some fodder to the conversation of what we might think our story is next, right? Because the truth is, there is a very large cadre, including one of my founding editors of Wired, of people I respect very much who are sort of intellectuals in this space, who basically have looked at this problem and said, you know what? This thing should just be out of control. It's going to be out of control. We can't have any control over it. Don't worry about governance. We can't govern it. It's bigger than us. We are really just a very, very small part of a story that's too big for us to comprehend. And I like that idea on a large level. It sort of feels like a, you know, abandon the ego and take acid kind of thing. But 
it just doesn't hit reality very well. You know, when people are killing each other and destroying each other's elections, we got to do something, right? Because if you take that point of view, you open yourself up to bad actors who take advantage of that point of view. And I just don't like that idea very much. So. Thank you so much, John, for a very engaging talk. <laughs>